ان الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين سيد الاولين والاخرين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته We want to look at the next ayah in Surah An-Nur but before that I think it would be irresponsible if we didn't address a couple of important issues because it's not fair that the ummah is living through something and we start talking about other things and not address things that are affecting us right here and right now So as I said, at least there are a couple things. The first of them is the fact that we as Muslims have to know how to react to situations. And we have to understand that as Muslims, we are required to think and not react out of emotion alone. And we cannot be bullied into reacting the way others want us to react. And we should not react and say things trying to please others but we have to react and we have to say things that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a muslim that's what matters to every single one of us how am i supposed to react to this according to the way of uh, the quran and the sunnah or according to the way outlined for me in the quran and in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So of course we've heard recently that there are um, you know a few crimes that have been, there are a few crimes that have been committed and just this morning there was a crime that was committed and uh, you know innocent people were killed. They were killed by an individual and it's made the news uh, and and those involved were not muslim that is the one the victims were not muslims and it appears that the suspect as well is not muslim and don't even get me started on that because we didn't hear the word terrorism every in each and every sentence nor did we hear about the religion of the suspect every uh, two seconds and so on and so forth You know, if the person was a person of color, and particularly if the person looked, as they say, Middle Eastern, there would have been a whole different narrative. In any event, that's another issue, and, and as I said, I don't want to get started on that. Now, we want to establish a few things. The first of those things is, we want to establish the fact that in Islam, a vulm, wrongdoing, evil, oppression, injustice is forbidden. A vuln in Islam is forbidden. It doesn't matter that that vuln or that injustice or oppression is carried out against Muslims or non-Muslims. Injustice is injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell us that we have to be just with the believers and unjust with the disbelievers. Rather, Allah Jalla wa'ala made it very clear that even if there's something between you and a group of people, even if there's some enmity or animosity between you and a group of people, be just. وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَاءَانُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا إِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلْتَقْوَىٰ Okay? So don't allow, don't allow some animosity that may exist between you and a people to not be just. So it doesn't matter that they're your enemy. It doesn't matter who they are, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, whether uh, you know, you're on good terms or you're on bad terms with one another. Even if you are on bad terms with one another, do not allow that to get in the way of you being just. I'dilu. And the command comes, I'dilu, be just. Why? That is closer to piety. That is closer to fearing Allah. That is closer to being, uh, to being righteous. Okay, so this is the first principle that we have to lay down. 
of dhulm, injustice in all its forms, is forbidden in Islam, and Muslims are commanded and ordered to be just under all circumstances. This is just to lay down the groundwork so that people don't start accusing us of things. Our religion is very clear on this type of, on this type of issue. Now, we see that uh, people were killed. Somebody walked into a place of worship and, and opened fire and a, a bunch of people died. Alright? Those people happen to be non-Muslims. Okay? Now, as I said, we're going to assume, of course, you know, because we, that's, that's our assumption, that these are innocent people. Alright? Irrespective, let's not allow our emotions to rule. Okay, the default position is, hang on a second, these are people that were just sitting there and, you know, they were taking part in, in, in prayers or whatever it may, they may have been doing. And, and you know, we, we don't agree with their prayers and the way that they pray, but that's neither here nor there in this situation. So these are innocent people who were killed. Now, as a result of it, of course, there's an uproar and, and people are angry and people are sad and so on and so forth. All right. These are all understandable reactions. Okay? If it happens in your community, if it happens in your country, you're going to be upset if, if these crimes are committed. But we also need to keep things in perspective. All right? So now it's making news and on the hour you're getting updates. And there are strong statements being made here and there. Okay, I'm not saying that I don't understand it. But at the same time, when people say that, you know, uh, every life matters, I'm sorry, but I don't believe you. I don't believe you when you tell me that lives matter. Because you who is in an uproar about these innocent lives being taken here, are watching and assisting the taking of innocent lives day in and day out. You're selling the weapons, you're giving them all sorts of support, you yourself are ordering those killings. So don't tell me that lives matter to you. It's only lives that you choose that matter to you. And you want us now, that is, you're going to expect some statements from Muslims. And you're going to expect all sorts of things from Muslims. That, that is a reality. Okay? Now, if that's the case, then we should expect that every moment of every day, you're making a statement about the, the, the thousands and thousands of, uh, of lives that are being taken. In Palestine, look at the lives that are being taken daily. Is there an uproar about that? No, because they're Muslims. And them being Muslims, they must be terrorists. And the terrorists are the ones who are taking their lives. That's the reality. And you support them. So let's just make sure that everything is in perspective. So Muslims, what reaction should we have? The same reaction we have with any calamity. We do not condone uh, people taking the law into their own hands. We do not condone acts of injustice, whether they are done against Muslims or non-Muslims. This is by default, you know, and, and that's why I said, if you expect us now to come up and we have to, as mosques and Islamic centers, we have to make these statements, then we demand that you also make those statements every day because you're killing people every day in Muslim lands. You want fair? Then that is fair. In any event, we do not condone uh, acts of injustice in any way, shape or form, no matter where they are done. Now an address to the Muslims. Because we see now that many Muslims, and, and this comes back to what I said earlier, we have to be intelligent and we have to think straight. We don't react out of emotion, we react based on, you know, what, what is in front of us in terms of facts and reality. So like Muslims are being killed and persecuted day in and day out. I don't see a thousand and one GoFundMe pages being put up every single day for the Muslims that are killed here and there. And they deserve it. Because they are being uh, tortured, and they are being killed and persecuted, and so on and so forth. So of course they deserve it. But we know that we can't change the world. And so we do what is within, within our capacity and, and what is within our means. 
all right? Because there are many Muslims that are starving throughout the world. They need the basics, the basic necessities of life. What have we done for them? But within a couple hours, this happens, and you know, Muslims are taking pride that they're able to raise so much money for the victims. Am I saying that it's absolutely haram and you cannot do it and it, 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 it's forbidden? This is not even the point. We're talking about putting things in perspective. We're talking about putting things in perspective. Don't react, don't have these knee-jerk reactions. And then we have prayers for the deceased, the non-Muslim deceased. And this is very important for Muslims to know. It is a, we spoke previously about mourning, and I, I spoke about that at the time of the uh, at the time of Ashura, because of what the Shia do, and that is, uh, you, you know, they beat themselves, and, and, and the way that they mourn. We explained at that time, this has nothing to do with Islam. All right, non-Muslims die. Are we allowed to pray for them, for the deceased? No, we, we are not. And yet you will find Muslims doing it. Why? Because they want to react in a way that will please others. They don't care that it displeases Allah. They don't care that it displeases Allah. They want to be polite, they want to be courteous. They say it's a sign of mercy and compassion. Ah. Allah, is He not more compassionate than you and me? Allah, is He not more merciful than you and me? Who, who is more merciful than Allah Jalla wa ala? Yet it is Allah from above the seven heavens who did not grant us permission to pray for the deceased of the non-Muslims. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, إِسْتَأْذَنْ تُ رَبِّي I took permission from my Lord. For what? Uh, he took permission uh, from his Lord to pray for his mother. لِأَسْتَغْفِرَ uh, لِأُمِّي uh, he took permission from Allah to pray for his own mother. And Allah did not give him permission. Then I took permission to at least visit her grave. And Allah granted me permission. Not to pray for her, to visit. And then later, we look at the other hadith. Why do we visit graves? Because they remind you of the hereafter. So you want deen, you want religion? It's not based on what you think. It's based on what is in the Quran and the Sunnah. Also listen, we said from above the seven heavens, Allah Jalla wa Ala forbade this. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ Now Allah Jalla wa Ala begins with His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. مَا كَانَ لِلنَّبِيِّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ يَسْتَغْفِرُوا لِلْمُشْرِكِينَ وَلَوْ كَانُوا أُولِي قُرْبًا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُمْ أَصْحَابُ الْجَحِيمِ What does this mean? Allah Jalla wa Ala tells us what it means. That it is not befitting. It is not permissible. It is not allowed for the Prophet and those who have believed to ask forgiveness for the mushrikeen, for the polytheists. Who are the polytheists? Anyone who is not a Muslim. Don't come and tell me now, oh, but Ahlul Kitab, Ahlul Kitab are from the Mushrikeen. Ahlul Kitab are from the Mushrikeen. Okay? Yes, they have certain ahkam or rulings that may be specific to them. That's another issue. But they fall under the category of Mushrikeen. They worship saints. They worship a man, a human being, Isa alayhi salam. Is that not shirk? That is by definition shirk. In any event. So for non-Muslims in general, it is not permissible to ask forgiveness for them, that is after they die. When they're alive, for us to pray for their guidance, this is permissible. As a matter of fact, why not? Don't we call them to Islam? Don't we ask Allah to soften their hearts and open their hearts to Islam? Of course we do. It is permissible to do that. And it is encouraged for us to call others to Islam. That's not what we're speaking of. We're speaking about when they die. So Allah Jalla wa Ala says that it is not permissible, not for the Prophet nor the believers, to ask forgiveness for the mushrikeen, the polytheists, the non-Muslims, even if they were relatives. 
after it has become clear that they are from the companions of the hellfire, they're going to hell. So somebody will say, well, how do you know now? But we don't speak about specific individuals, but we're speaking about in general. And there is no doubt in our minds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us over and over that the non-Muslims, the mushrikeen, will go to hell. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ خَارِدِينَ فِيهَا Very clear in Surah Al-Bayyina as well. Alright? Ahlul Kitab and the Mushrikeen. Both are included there. Okay, so they're going to go to hell. If they died upon kufr. We did not have the privilege to look into their hearts. So we treat people at face value. If they were Muslims, they prayed, they came to our masajid and so on and so forth. Khalas, we treat them as Muslims. They were not, then they are non-Muslims. And they will go to hell as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ Hadith Sahih, authentic hadith. He swears by Allah. لَا يَسْمَعُ بِي أَحَدٌ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ وَلَا يَهُودِينَ وَلَا نَصْرَانِينَ No one who hears of me from this nation, and, and you know, even the nation of da'wah, in other words, the people who are, being, who, who are not Muslim, but who are, uh, if you will, the targets of our da'wah. Uh, the audience of our call, being, calling them to Islam. وَلَا يَهُودِيٌّ وَلَا نَصْرَانِي ثُمَّ يَمُوتُ And then they die. So they've heard of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They've heard of something called Islam. Okay? But they die. وَلَمْ يُؤْمِنْ بِالَّذِي أُرْسِلْتُ بِهِ And they did not believe in what I was sent with. إِلَّا كَانَ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّارِ Except that he will be from the inhabitants, uh, inhabitants of the hellfire. So this is how we can say it. Non-Muslims will go to hell because of what Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, has told us. Now, making dua for them, that is for the deceased. Now to make dua for the living, that is for the family of the, uh, of the deceased and so on and so forth, that is fine. We ask Allah to console them and to bring them to Islam. Is that clear? They're still alive. We can make dua for them in that. That may, that may Allah you know, console them and bring them to Islam. These are examples I'm giving. But, but those who died amongst them, that's it. And we leave their matter between them and Allah. That's the end of the story. But we do not go and attend candlelight vigils and we don't go and attend church gatherings in which they, they have prayers being said for them and so on and so forth and I say to you wallahi thumma wallahi we have now among the Muslims so-called scholars who will do this know that they are dajajila know that these people are not to be listened to anymore until they repent of what they've done enough is enough they are leading the ummah astray all in the name of social justice and and they, they call it compassion. What compassion? Allah is more compassionate than anyone on the face of this earth. Allah His compassion and mercy knows no limits. And yet He has doomed people to hell. And He has forbidden us from praying for certain types of people. So don't come and tell me otherwise. If you're going to insist on that, then you have committed kufr. Because you're going against what Allah has clearly stated in the Qur'an. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to call upon him. Udru Rabbakum Tadaru an wa khufya innahu la yuhibbun mu'tadeen. Ah, but be careful. So we are to call upon Allah, make dua to Allah in humility and to do it privately. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he does not like the transgressors. And transgressing in dua is when we ask for things that are not possible. When we ask for things that are inconceivable. When we ask for things that Allah has not permitted us to ask for. Is that the same? And the ulama, they give examples of that when they speak of asking for mercy for the, for, for, for the deceased among the non-Muslims. This is al-i'tida'u fi dua Transgressing when it comes to dua. So let's get our facts straight. Once again, we do not condone. We do not condone injustice in any way, shape or form. But we don't allow ourselves to react, uh, you know, um, out of emotion. Just 
Because that's what people expect of us. No, what does Allah expect of you? Look, in terms of being, being sad about things, why not? I mean, if something tragic happens, of course you're going to be sad. Right? I mean, Allah forbid, but you know, uh, an apartment building or a house goes up in flames and perhaps they are your neighbors and they were non-Muslims and they burn in that fire. Are you going to be happy about it? I mean, these are neighbors who probably were very kind to you and you were kind to them and there was a relationship between you. Khalas, you're allowed to be sad. Nobody said you can't be sad. But if they are non-Muslims, you're not allowed to pray for, the, for mercy for them. This is what Allah willed for them. It is Allah's decision, not mine or yours. Okay? So that human reaction that we may have of being sad, yes, but it has to be measured. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. He entered upon his son Ibrahim, who was breathing his last breaths. And what happened? He teared up. The Prophet ﷺ had tears in his eyes. Abdullah ibn Awfin radiyallahu anhu arda. Do you know what he said? Wa anta ya Rasulullah. And you too, O Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in response he said, innaha rahmah. It is mercy that Allah has placed in our hearts. Innaha rahmah. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Ibn Awf, huh? Abdullah ibn, ibn Awf. He said, ya Ibn Awf, إن العين لا تدمع وإن القلب لا يحزن. and then what did he say? ولا نقول ولا نقول إلا ما يرضي ربنا. that makes it so abundantly clear. yes, the eyes may shed tears, the heart becomes sad, but we don't say except that which pleases Allah. So we don't say, they were not meant to die. When somebody dies, guess what? They were meant to die. I mean, this is the will of Allah. Allah has decided. Everything has its term with Allah Jalla wa'ala. We don't object. Why? How come? Oh, this was too soon. No. Because none of this pleases Allah. This is us now objecting to the qada. I just, I, I didn't want to go on too long about it, but I wanted to make sure that we are living this now. So we need to make things clear. And I'm sick and tired of seeing all of these so-called scholars and du'at going out and joining these candlelight vigils and prayers and so on and so forth. Innahu batin. It is false. It is unacceptable. It is something which displeases Allah Jalla wa'ala. Our reactions have to be measured. Okay? We don't have to like what happened. We, uh, of course, uh, you, you know, will do what we need to do to prevent uh, unnecessary crime or crimes from taking place. And I mean, of course, this is this is a no-brainer. We are all for justice, okay? But it also has to be very measured, and we have to understand what we are doing. We cannot act. Uh, solely on uh, on emotion. Bye. The second issue before we look at the ayah that we wanted to look at uh, this evening is, uh, and, and as I said at the beginning, we cannot uh, we cannot you know talk about uh, issues that Alhamdulillah are important and neglect other ones that we are living now, things that are affecting us right now. Okay. So of the things that are affecting us now, I mean, we're living in days when all of a sudden we're going to see different uh, celebrations and holidays and festivals coming up, right? There's going to be Halloween and then there's going to be what? I guess Remembrance Day and then there's going to be Christmas and there's going to be New Year's, like one thing after another. And of course with the Indians, there's uh, the, the Hindus, there's uh, Diwali, maybe the Sikhs also have that. So there's all kinds of different celebrations going on. Okay, and it's really disturbing that we find so many Muslims taking these matters lightly. Like they think there's nothing wrong in participating. Like it's also, you know, the whole thing of, oh, it's just to be polite. What do you mean to be polite? Do you know that we are Muslims and we are an honored people? 
you know, we, we can't debase ourselves by just following anything and everything out there. Mm -hmm. And any and every festival and occasion and holiday and so on and so forth, it all has, you know, it, it all, all has some basis. And that is why, you know, some of the ulama say, if all the atheists got together and decided they wanted to have a holiday of some sort, and they are atheists, meaning that they say they don't, they don't, they don't have any sort of beliefs, it would be haram for us to follow in that holiday as well. Do you know why? Because atheism is a religion. Atheism is a religion. Their religion is that they deny the existence of Allah. So let, let's, be, let's be intelligent about things. Look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, فَاسْتَمْسِكْ بِالَّذِي أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ عَلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ وَإِنَّهُ لَذِكْرٌ لَكَ وَلِقَوْمِكَ وَسَوْفَ تُسْأَلُونَ طيب, what am I trying to get at when, when, when I mention these ayat of the Qur'an? I'm trying to get to the point that we as Muslims have a unique identity. And that identity of ours, the Islamic identity, is one that is developed from what is in the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Your identity is not what you eat, so if you eat curry or if you eat uh, hummus, and, and this, this is not your identity. We're talking about the primary thing in one's identity is their belief system. So we have been given the Qur'an by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Jalla wa Ala says what means we have certainly sent down to you a book that is the Quran in which is your mention and in which there is a reminder for you. Then will you not reason? Will you not think? Allah Jalla wa Ala also uh, says what means so adhere to that which is revealed to you. Referring to what? The Quran. Right? Indeed, you are on a straight path. And indeed, it is a remembrance for you and your people, and you all are going to be questioned. Questioned by whom? By Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. So both of these, both of these verses, they, talk, they, 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 they indicate the great importance of sticking to the Qur'an and the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because we know that in them is honor. That is in the Qur'an and in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is honor and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that very clear when he says وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ that to Allah belongs all honor and to his messenger and to the believers وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ but the hypocrites do not know or they do not comprehend they do not understand so this honor that we have is because of Al-Islam, the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And this is why uh, the, um, the Khalifa Umar, radiallahu anhu wa arda, what did he say? He said, radiallahu anhu wa arda, that we were the, the most... Um, the, 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 we were people who were far astray. We were, yeah, or a disgraced people. Right? And Allah honored us with Islam. So as long as we seek honor in other than Islam, kunna adhallakum, uh, the most uh, disgraced of people, dishonorable of people. And Allah gave us honor through Islam. And what is Islam other than qala Allah wa qala Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What is in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then he says, فَمَهْمَ بْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّةَ فِي غَيْرِهِ And as long as we look for honor outside it, in other than it, أَذَلَّنَ Allah, Then Allah will humiliate us and disgrace us. And that is what's happening to us now. So we, we, we need to be very clear. This Islamic identity is something we need, to be, uh, we, need to be, we need to be proud of. And the least, the very least that can be said, okay, about just taking part in all of these different holidays and, 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 and celebrations and, and, and festivals, is that it is an imitation, an imitation of other than the people of Islam. 
an imitation of disbelievers. And the Prophet says, as in the hadith reported or narrated by Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhuma, man tashabbaha bi qawmin, fahuwa minhum. One who imitates the people is, is, is of them, becomes like them. Do you want to be likened to disbelievers who are going to go to hell? The worst of, of, of creatures in the sight of Allah Jalla wa'ala. Let's think. Let's not allow ourselves to get emotional. The fact that some of us have gone so far astray and we've opened our hearts to disbelievers to the extent that we love them as much as we love believers, that is not an excuse. No, we have to repent of that. This whole thing of, oh, but we're all one family. No, ya akhi. Al mar'u ma'aman ahab. Think about it carefully. You will be with whom you love. That is in the akhirah. The believers will be in Jannah. The disbelievers will be in, in Jahannam. In the hellfire. So decide where you want to be now. When we say that, when we're talking about love, we're talk love has different, uh, different degrees even. Okay? The natural love you have for... Uh, uh, for a relative and so on and so forth. This is not what we're talking about. But that love which causes you to be so close to that individual and, and, and leads you to, uh, you, you know, to, to even to do things that will please them. Uh, to do things that will please them. So when we celebrate with them, what is that? It is because of the love that we have for them that we don't want to hurt their feelings. But it doesn't matter that we anger our Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we understand what we're getting now? مَنْ تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ And look, assimilating should not even be in our, in our minds. We do not want to assimilate in the society in which we live. Which means we become part of that melting pot. And we just live exactly like everybody else lives. No. We are different and we will always be different. To integrate in that we learn how to live and function within the society, we learn the language of the people, we learn skills that we need to learn in order to, to be productive members of the society. Ah, oh, this is good. I mean, we don't want to be beggars in the society. We don't want to be the, you know, the worst of the worst in the society. No, we have to learn to integrate, to be a part of society while maintaining our distinct and unique identity. Do we see the difference between assimilation and that? But we are allowing ourselves and our children to become assimilated and become part of that melting pot and this is not, and this is not correct. You know, for people who say, oh, but you don't want to stick out and you don't want to stand out. No, no, you do want to. You want to be known as that person who takes the moral high ground. You want to be known as that person who stands for the truth. You want to be known as that person who stands for justice. You want to be known as that person who believes in only one God and who calls to that one God. This is what you want to be recognized as. And in order to be recognized, you, you, you will be different in this society. Right? Because you live in a non-Muslim society. You know the Prophet ﷺ tried to do things differently than the non-Muslims. Even in the appearance. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the men to grow their beards. Khalifu. Be different from the mushrikeen, from the pagans. Lengthen your beards, shorten your mustaches. Just as an example. You know also, uh, so in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, uh, one of them mentioned, one of them mentioned how the Jews, when their women were menstruating, they would not even sit and eat with them. They wouldn't even sit and eat with them. And even in their homes, they would be segregated. Like they wouldn't want to mix with them. They wouldn't show intimacy in any way, shape, or form with them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed ayat. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ الْمَحِيدِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ then the ayat came in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke of this issue. فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيدِ And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained, okay, 
uh, it's harmful. This menstruation is harmful. In other words, for you to have intercourse with your wives while they are menstruating, this is a harmful thing. So do not do so while they are menstruating. And the Prophet told uh, the Sahabi who asked him, you know, they don't even mix with them in their homes. He said, Isna'u aw if'alu kulla shay'in Do everything except al-jima' Except having intercourse When the Jews heard of it, they said, oh, what's wrong with this guy? Like, what does he want? There isn't anything except that he wants to be different than us Ma yuridu hadha rajul Ma yuridu hadha rajul What does this man want? An yada'a min amrina shay'an illa khalafana bi there isn't anything that, except that he wants to be different than us. He comes to Al-Madinah, sees the people partying and enjoying. He says, no, Allah, Allah has replaced those two days with better days. Al-Adha and Al-Fitr. And here, for those deviants, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have to use these words, the so-called scholars and du'as, they say, no, these are things that people do as habits. They are adat with aqaleed. The, the, these are just customary things. It's okay. You can be, you can do like, the, and especially, you know, it's so hard for the non new Muslims. What do we do with the new Muslims then? You know, you're going to chase them away. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was a new Muslim. Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu was a new Muslim. Sahwala la. Were they Muslims uh, before they came to know about Al Islam? All of these others who accepted Islam in the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were born into kufr who practiced kufr perhaps beforehand. These, some of them used to be, you know, uh, idolaters. But they became Muslim. But because they knew what Islam meant, they didn't say, oh, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, how, how do we deal with our families? They didn't have families like the new Muslims today have families? Ya akhi, don't come to me with that garbage. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying any of that. But, innahul iman. It's all about faith. How much do you believe in Allah? What is the number one priority in your life? Pleasing Allah or worrying about others? Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. Today, today, we find people that, that, that will bend over backwards and will, are willing to sacrifice and be, you know, the black sheep in their homes by announcing that they're gay. <laughs> in reality. But we're shy to say, I'm a Muslim. Islam forbids me from practicing this. How difficult is it yet? Not taking part in, in Christmas Eve and Christmas and Halloween and New Year's. And there is nothing wrong with saying, my religion forbids it. If you are so open-minded, and if you are so accepting of everything, then have that respect. You don't have to agree with me, but at least respect my choice not to celebrate and not to take part in those celebrations. It doesn't, it, it, you know, it, it's not rocket science. You know, these are relatively basic things. Oh, they'll get angry. Okay. So you'd rather anger Allah and keep them happy. Is that what we're saying now? We need, and this is why I keep saying, put things in perspective. We have to look at the big picture. Tomorrow we will meet Allah. How are we going to meet Allah? So giving all these con you know, so-called concessions, we're all for giving concessions. We are all for giving concessions as long as they are justified within the framework of Islam. As long as Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam give us those concessions. As a matter of fact, Allah loves and tukta rukhasu. Allah loves that you take His concessions. When you travel, did you know it's better for you to pray the two rak'ah than four? As a matter of fact, according to some, such as the, the Hanafi Madhab, alayhim rahmatullah, they say, it's not even allowed for you to complete four rak'ah. You have to pray just the two because you're traveling. You see, to what extent? Yes, because this is, a, you know, a concession granted by Allah. It's a gift granted by Allah. Why throw it back? 
you're not willing to accept that concession from Allah, but it is not me and it is not you who make those concessions. It is Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we need to be really careful when it comes to this. Like I said, these are things that we are living today. And so we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, we're up to date. That we understand where we stand in these, uh, in these circumstances. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen our iman and may He make matters easy for us. So I urge everyone, be balanced, be measured in your reactions. I urge everyone, don't be like sheep, that you just follow blindly. No, think about what we're doing, and let's make sure that whatever it is that we are doing is uh, not going against the teachings of Al-Islam. So we want to look then uh, very quickly at this ayah that we have come to, uh, ayah 35 of Surah An-Nur. In it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الله نور السماوات والأرض مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم يم... ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يَهْدِ اللَّهُ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٍ So a quick uh, translation of the meanings of the ayah and then we get into the slightly deeper meanings. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. The example of His light, that is, uh, that He places in the hearts of the believers is like a niche within which is a lamp. The lamp is within glass. The glass as if it were a pearly white star lit from the oil of a blessed olive tree, neither of the east nor of the west, whose oil would almost glow even if untouched by fire, light upon light. Allah guides to His light whom He wills. And Allah presents examples for the people and Allah is knowing of all things. طيب, الله نور السماوات والأرض. A few things here. First of all, of course, Allah نور. Allah is نور. Allah is light. But don't think light as in, you know, the light that we see. From the attributes, if you will, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He is نور. The essence of Allah jalla wa ala is that He is نور. He is light. But again, do not try to liken that light to the light that you and I are familiar with. When it comes to Allah Jalla wa Ala, we you know, affirm what He has said, but we, don't, we do not in any way, shape or form liken Him to His, to his creation. Also, when we say Allah Nuru Samawati Wal Ard, He is the light of the heavens and the earth. In other words, He has given the heavens and the earth light. He has created the light for them. Okay? Through his light, they have attained, they have attained light. And we, when we speak of light, of course, we speak of a physical light, and we also speak of, if you will, uh, a metaphoric or a spiritual light. What is the physical light? Of course, the light that we see. So, uh, the light of the heavens and the earth, you know, and uh, the sun and the moon, for example. Right? Right. So, Allah Jalla wa ala has placed light therein. As well, the nur. When we say to somebody, oh, now you've seen the light. Do we mean you've seen uh, a physical light? No, you've seen the truth. You've seen the light, you've seen the truth. You've been guided. All right, so Allah Jalla wa Ala sent the Quran. Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala sent His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sent many ayat, many, uh, many signs and so on and so forth. All of these are means of light. In other words, means of guidance. Things. Uh, leading us towards towards the truth. Uh, so this is why uh, when, when we speak of Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard, we have to first uh, know Allahu Nur. Allah is light, but not light that you and I are familiar with. Allahu Jalla Wa Ala knows best the true nature of that light. Then we understand light that is given to us through the sun, for example. This is this is a light that Allahu Jalla Wa Ala 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has given, who has given uh, that light. Okay? Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Also, when we, uh, you know, for those who, who don't like to use the word, uh, you know, nur for Allahu jalla wa ala, no, 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 no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses it himself. Wa ashraqati al ardu bi nuri rabbiha. Okay? So as far as the earth is concerned and how it becomes bright is from the nur of, of its Lord. Okay? Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to make dua so the earth will shine with the, with the light of its Lord, like we said. And also in the, uh, in the Sunnah of the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, Allahumma laka alhamd anta nuru samawati wal ard. Oh Allah, all uh, praises belong to you. You are the light of the heavens and the earth and everything uh, that is contained uh, within them. A'udhu bi nuri wajhik. Also, the Prophet ﷺ would seek refuge with the uh, light of uh, the, uh, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala الذي أشرقت به الظلمات Through which all uh, darkness uh, became or, or attained, attained light. طيب. Now we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us a parable. And this is of course something very common in the Qur'an. Allah jalla wa ala gives us these examples of parables to bring things closer uh, to our minds, for us to, to be able to picture and for us to understand things a little bit more clearly. So he says the example of his light. What, what is being spoken of here? The example of his light, meaning that light which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in the hearts of human beings. Okay, what we refer to as an iman or faith. Mathalu uh, nurihi as he says subhanahu wa ta'ala, kamishkatin fiha misbah. So let's try to, uh, uh, let, let's try to picture all of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is mentioning, is mentioning here. And I'll rely uh, quite a bit on something that Ibn al-Qayyim alayhi rahmatullah has mentioned. So he said, you know, so try to picture here we have a room. Now, and, and you're thinking back in the old days. Okay, they didn't have electricity, so a flick of a switch, Okay, that, we're not talking about that. So think of a, of a dark room, and what did they used to do to, um, uh, you know, to bring light into the room? Okay, they would have a niche, okay? A, a, a niche, a kuwa, um, sort of a, a recess in the wall, okay? In which they would place a lamp, all right? So then, here we are, we have this room, and then, so, so that's the world around us, okay? And then you have that niche. That niche now, what is it likened to in terms of a human being? The chest. Fiha misbah. And in that, uh, in, in that niche, okay, is, uh, is a light. That is, as we said, the heart. That is the heart. So, al mishka is the chest. Uh, well, okay, let, let's, let's be a little bit more specific. Fiha zujaja. Right. So the zujaja, so now you're looking at a lamp, and the lamp has a glass on it, right? Right. So that glass is, let, let's liken that to the, uh, to the heart. And the misbah, the actual light, that is iman. That is, that is faith. Okay, so we got it. So you have the niche, which is like your chest. That glass, which is like your heart. And the light which is within it, that is faith. That is faith. So this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَثَلُ نُورِهِ كَمِشْكَاتٍ فِيهَا مِسْبَاحِ الْمِسْبَاحُ فِي زُجَاجَةٍ So that misbah, that light, which is the faith, is inside the glass, which is, which is the heart. الزُجَاجَةُ كَأَنَّهَا We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in just, uh, in just a short while. Now, the prophets or uh, the, the, the ulama, the ulama, because you know when it comes to these parables, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets these parables for us and the scholars, they ponder and they think about these things. Okay, they think about these things and they try to, uh, they, they try to imagine, so what is the message that Allah jalla wa ala is getting, is getting across to us? If you think about this niche, 
Okay? And you think about that glass, and that glass we said is the heart. What qualities does that glass possess? In order for that glass, because remember there's going to be a fire within it, okay? So there are certain qualities within that glass. First of all, we know that it is very delicate. That is the nature of glass. So the heart of the believer also, so we try to give that we tried to give that example, right? So the heart of the believer, from its qualities, that it is that it's delicate and it's soft, okay? From the qualities of that glass, okay? Uh, uh, and al uh, masabi uh, uh, as they say, okay. The second, the second description that is given here in the ayah is that it is white, meaning that it is pure, that it is pure. So the heart of the believer is also is also pure. By a third exam or a third description that we have of that glass. Okay, so you picture that glass uh, of a lantern, of uh, of a light. Then it has to be it has to be hard also, right? Because it can't just break. It, it can't break easily. So how is it now that this applies to uh, to the believer? Well. The believer's heart is gentle and it is soft towards whom? Towards other believers and towards, towards relatives. The Prophet said, وَأَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ ثَلَاثَةِ رَجُلٌ رَحِيمٌ رَحِيقُ الْقَلْبِ لِكُلِّ ذِي قُرْبَى وَمُؤْمِنٌ So the, the, he said that um, the people of Jannah huh, are three, or they have three qualities. And amongst them he mentioned a person who is merciful and compassionate and whose heart is soft for every for every relative and for every for every mu'min, for every believer. Also, look to the Quran. And you know here again, people people just have this tendency to follow like sheep. They don't think. So you know, we find in the West, all of a sudden, people now started using another language. They said, no, no, no. It's all about love. Everything is about love. You have to love everybody and you have to love everything. No, ya ahbab. That is not true. The proof of that, and because we're talking about the heart of the believer, the heart of the believer has compassion and it is soft towards believers. Okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly in the Qur'an says Muhammadun Rasulullah Muhammad is the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ and those with him, his companions and by extension his followers أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ they are hard with the disbelievers yes this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking. I'm not giving my, my two cents worth here. Ashidda'u ala al-kuffar. We are stern with them. We are hard against them. It doesn't mean we are unjust. See, this is the whole thing. That when we, we use that word, all of a sudden people equate it with injustice. No! You can be fair and just, but you can be firm towards them as well. Look, let me give you a very simple example. In the criminal system, even among, amongst non-Muslims, Okay? Are they not tough with criminals? Are they not harsh towards the criminals? They have to be. The full force of the law, right? That's being hard. But does that mean they're going to be unjust? I mean, perfectly speaking, if, you know, if they're actually doing things right, then they have to be tough with the criminal, but they have to be just as well. They cannot torture that criminal, they cannot, right? There's all sorts of laws to protect the criminal. So then, how come we can understand it from man-made laws, but when it comes to faith, we can't understand it? Let's make it very clear. <laughs> but they are merciful towards, uh, towards one another. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Ya ayyuhal nabiyu, jahid al-kuffara wal-munafiqina waghlub alayhim. So he says to fight against the disbelievers and the hypocrites and to be, to be tough with them. So, once again, the heart of the believer is gentle and soft towards the people of Iman. 
towards people of faith, towards other Muslims, and of course towards relatives as well. Tayyib. We said it also has to be um, sort of, um, it is hard also, right? It is tough also. Tough, like that glass which has to withstand the heat of the fire that is within it, correct? So then it has to be tough in terms of remaining firm against, um, against oppression and firm remaining upon upon the truth. So in the face of, of you know, confronting um, enemies and so on and so forth, it has to be, it has to be tough. طيب. And the heart of the believer, the heart of the believer naturally is pure. So, and, 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 and you know, we refer to it as a whiteness. And of course, when we say something is white, it's, it's, it's pure, like a, like a pearl. Okay? So these are things that we, um, that we need to keep in mind. Okay, so we have this example now of that niche from which the light has to spread throughout the room, okay? And within that niche is that lamp, which consists of that glass and, and, and a light within it. And the fuel of that light, of course, is, uh, is oil, as, as Allah mentions, mentions here. But let's go back to that glass. What happens to that glass? And maybe some of us have seen those lanterns. Do they need to be maintained or not? They need to be maintained. Because what happens when that fire is burning within it? This, the inside of that glass turns black. And if it's left that way, is it going to be able to emanate that light and light up the room? No. So that glass, we said, is the heart the heart becomes blackened also. Just like the glass of that lantern, the heart can also become blackened. And this we learn from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ So, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions this and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explains it. Explains it to us that the heart becomes black. Now when we talk about black, of course, here we're speaking about what? Uh, obviously not a, not a physical blackness, but a, but a darkness, if you will. Huh? That it's, it, it's a cover over the heart. Uh, but, but, but it's metaphorically speaking, or uh, spiritually speaking. All right? So the Prophet ﷺ said, every time that a person commits a sin, then a, a black dot is placed on the heart. Every time a sin is committed, another black dot is placed. But when that individual repents, when that individual then begs of Allah's forgiveness after feeling remorse and, and, and you know, sort of having that resolve not to go back to it, then what happens? Then that blackness is removed. And the Prophet wasallam, as we know, used to beg of Allah's forgiveness each and every day at least 70 times. And in some narrations, 100 times. This was the Prophet ﷺ. So just like that glass needs to be maintained and cleaned. And you know, uh, people in the old days will tell you how, uh, you know, uh, the mothers or the grandmothers used to sit and they used to have a cloth and they used to wet it and they used to wipe the inside of it because they have to make sure that the lamp is, you know, clean. And, 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 and the fire can, can, can spread its light from, from, from within. So we have to think of our hearts in that way as well. And these hearts, you know what? Nobody but nobody should be so conceited as to think that they don't sin and their hearts are pure. We hear this all the time from people, oh, but my heart's clean. Really? And how do you know that? We all strive to have pure hearts. But those pure hearts are only going to be pure if we constantly and regularly beg of Allah's forgiveness. You know that the uh, Prophet wasallam told us, that the nature of human, the, the, the human being is that they will sin. This is a, the fact that we're going to sin is a given. And this is why the Prophet wasallam he told us that if, he, he swore by Allah, he said that if you were not to sin, لَوْلَمْ تُذْنِبُ Let's say for the sake of argument that none of you sinned, all of you were perfect. لَذَهَبَ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ 
Allah would have gotten rid of you. And He would have come with the people who sin. But then they repent. They beg of Allah's forgiveness and Allah forgives them. Okay? Also, if you look to the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He tells us in the Hadith Qudsi, Ya Ibadi, innakum tukhti'una bil-layli wa nahar This is Allah speaking to us. Oh my slaves, you err, you sin day and night. Huh? But I forgive all sins. In other words, turn to me, seeking my forgiveness, and I shall, and I shall forgive you. So there are many evidences in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ which show us that we are going to sin. This is the nature of a human being. But we have to maintain it just like the glass is, ma is maintained. Uh, for the lantern, and that is, it has to be cleansed, and we will cleanse ourselves and our hearts and our souls through uh, through repentance. Bye. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. There, there are quite a few other um, there are quite a few other texts, but I think we have spoken about this earlier on in the surah when we spoke of Atoba, so we will not uh, we will not repeat those. Uh, we will not repeat those. Uh, right now. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Az-Zujajatu ka'annaha kawkabun durriyun yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytuna. Right. So in the, uh, uh, in the quick translation, we talked about the lamp, uh, which is, the lamp which is within the glass, okay? The glass as if it were a pearly white star lit from the oil of a blessed olive tree, neither of the east nor uh, nor the West. Okay, so as far as the fuel, we know that it is, uh, it is an oil. And that oil is olive oil. Okay, that's, uh, that's very clear in, 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 in all of the, um, in all of the tafasir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to this blessed tree. A blessed tree, we talk about barakah, which means that there is goodness in it, and that goodness increases and that goodness is lasting okay so it's goodness which is lasting so this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing that oil and as a matter of fact if you think about olive oil I mean nowadays it was always known to the Muslims alhamdulillah and they always used it as a cure for different things whether it be to put on their skin or to put in their hair or to eat for that matter Okay, and now we hear about all these new discoveries that olive oil is healthy. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we knew it. We knew it a long time ago. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala refers to that olive tree as a blessed tree, a tree with with, with a lot of goodness in it, with lasting goodness in it, with many many uh, benefits. لا شرقية ولا غربية. Many different. Um, so neither of the east, or, uh, you know, nor nor the west. What, what does all, all of that mean? There are many different opinions, but. Uh, of the opinions that, that, that seem to be more prominent is that they are the trees which are in higher places. Why? La sharqiyya wa la gharbiyya Meaning that it's not like they're in such a place where they're exposed to the sun only at a certain time of the day. But rather, they are in a place, in a, in a higher place on a hill or a mountain where they get sun throughout the day. Where they get sun directly throughout the day. And as I said, there are different opinions, but this seems to be the more, uh, the more prominent of the opinions uh, that are mentioned. And the Prophet ﷺ also encouraged um, the use of, uh, the use of, uh, the use of olive oil, okay? Um, so this, this oil is so pure, يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْكُ نَارُ and I think some of us have seen pure oil and how it, it glistens, it shines on its own. So it's as if it's going to light up the room without fire even touching it. Uh, here, remember that there's a method here, now there's a, there's a parable that, has been, that is being given. That is like the pure faith in the heart of a believer. The pure faith in the heart of a believer. A believer who is, who is upon al-fitra, that natural state in which they were born. That pure oil, it's like that pure faith in the heart of a believer that has not been tainted with the many sins and so on and so forth. What does it mean that it's, 
you, you, you know the way that uh, the, the translation goes, that it's um, uh, whose oil would almost glow even if untouched by fire. Uh, for the believer, this means that even before evidence comes to them from the Quran and the Sunnah, even before them knowing evidences, Subhanallah, it's like they're speaking the truth. They're able to speak the truth. They, 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 they say wise words even without having seen the evidence because of the pureness of their hearts. Look to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu Allah, a prime example. Umar radiallahu an, look at on how many occasions he would advise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of something. He just would have, because of the, the fitrah, the strong iman, that strong faith he had, and because his um, burden of sins was not a heavy one. He had a really pure heart. And so he would say, you know, let's say, for, what examples do we have? He said to the Prophet wasallam, what about if your wives were to cover themselves? Hijab. Ah. Ayat of hijab came afterwards. Umar's opinion, and Allah confirms it with revelation. In Badr, you shouldn't take the ransom. Ah. Ayat come afterwards, confirming the opinion of Umar radiallahu anhu wa So these are examples. Look at that light, it's, or that oil, it's like it's going to brighten up the room with, before the, 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 the fire even reaches. Think about the heart of the believer. SubhanAllah, the more uh, pure the heart is, that is the less sins that one has, the more wisdom they will have. The more that when they speak, they will make sense, even before. So imagine now, imagine now, if that oil is ignited. Ah, same thing. What if evidence reaches that heart from the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ? Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. This is why when we look to the ayah again, مِن شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ زَيْتُونَةٍ لَا شَرْقِيَةٍ وَلَا غَرْبِيَةٍ يَكَادُ زَيْتُهَا يُضِيءُ وَلَوْ لَمْ تَمْسَسْهُ نَارٍ Nurun ala nur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this is light. Uh, this is light upon, upon light. So now, when we look at the heart of the believer, and we see that, the, that this Iman is there, in order for that Iman to have an effect on the body, right? For it, so, so you want that the light will be, will be spread, right? Dispersed in the room. That's why that glass has to be pure. So for us, this is the importance of having these pure hearts. In other words, lessening our sins, having those hearts purified and cleansed as that glass is cleansed through repentance, through seeking forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through, through all of that, so, so then this nur, that uh, light of, of faith that is in our hearts, it can be seen. It can be seen how? It can be, be seen through our actions. And that light will spread. Because when we do good, we don't do it only for ourselves, do we? We try to make sure we do good for others as well. So this is uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Nurun ala nur. Tayyib. Now, we hear from people sometimes arguments. Because listen to the, the, to, to, to the rest of the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yahdillahu li nurihi man yasha. So much to be said here. Among those things which have to be said is, يَهْدِ لِنُورِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah guides to His light whom He wills. Meaning, that none of us should think, MashaAllah, I'm wow, I'm really something. Alhamdulillah, you know, I pray at night and I do this and I do that. No. Understand and know well that this is purely a favor from Allah. This nur that reached your heart, this faith that you have, the fact that you are a Muslim, is not by your own doing. This is a, a pure favor from Allah Jalla wa ala. He subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to guide whomever He wishes. Yahdi Allahu man yasha. Right? So we, we cannot now take credit for things that we have nothing to do with. Okay? So, Yahdi Allahu li nurihi man yasha. Also from here we have to understand 
there are some people who are not guided. Some people remain non-Muslim. You and I cannot object. You and I cannot say, but why? And you hear these arguments. So why is it that I'll go to heaven and they won't go to heaven? I didn't, you know, what, what, what did I do that was different than them? But this wasn't your choice. This was the choice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was not your choice. So don't object, you know, to the choice of Allah jalla wa ala. And the other thing you have to know is this. Allah knows everyone better than they know themselves. Okay? You know yourself better than others know you. For example, right? So when you look at another person, you can't say, Oh, but they're so good and say they're so sincere. No, no, no. Understand, if that person has a pure heart, if they are truly seeking the truth, if they really are sincere and looking for the truth, Allah will guide them. Rest assured, there's no two ways about that. There is no two ways about that. Yahdillahu linurihi mayyasha. So let's make sure that we never, ever, in any way, shape, or form, question the guidance or misguidance of a person. Meaning that why why is this person guided and why is that person uh, not guided? No, this is not my choice, nor your choice. This is up to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Um, there are other ayat in the Quran. So Allah Jalla wa ala chooses to allow some people to go astray. He leads some people astray and he leads some people to the truth. This is his choice and he is perfect and he knows and he knows best. Very interesting here as well. And Allah presents examples for the people and we have seen that. We, in many places of the Quran, Allah Jalla wa ala gives these parables or these examples. It is for the people to ponder and think about. But look at what's interesting is Allah says, Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim, and Allah uh, is knowing of all things. What does that refer to? Well, it could, two things that come to mind. He says that he gives these examples. So, one thing that it could mean is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives these examples and he knows who understood it correctly, or who understood them correctly, and who did not understand them correctly. He knows best at the end of the day what he meant by those, by those examples. That's one. And the other interpretation here, and it's, uh, of course, very legitimate, and, 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 and it's in its place. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim, so yahdi Allahu li nurihi mayyasha. Allah guides to his light, whomever he wills. And now, the ending of the ayah, and Allah knows all things. So he knows who deserves to be guided and who does not deserve to be guided. That is the other part that we have to take from this ayah. So, once again, and, and, and I mention it because we live it all the time, we hear people make these silly arguments, right? So why, so why is it that he chose you and he didn't choose me? Well, it's that these are not our decisions. The fact that I have faith, Allah chose me and for wisdom that He knows. And remember that when Allah, Allah does as He pleases. But know and rest assured that nothing is done without a wisdom. In everything there is a hikmah, there is a wisdom. That is the nature of Allah, that Allah is Al-Hakim. He is Alim, He is all-knowing, He is Khabir, He is aware of all things. And he is Hakim, he is most wise. He is all wise. So nothing will be done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that there is a good reason, uh, there is a good reason behind it. Alright? So they said that these, uh, or we just had time for this one ayah, um, and, and, and so we want to, uh, you know, we want to conclude with that. If there are any uh, questions or comments, we can take those before Salat al Isha. No, this is a Jazak al for the excellent speech. I, I, f um, I think it's a, it's a disease that a lot of Muslims have, especially living in the West, that we, we, we like in our heart, we kind of feel bad that these non Muslims are going to hellfire. Oh, these people are going to hellfire forever, you know? And 
I mean, is it, could this be related to having a weak Muslim identity? Could it be, uh, is there something we can do to help us, to prevent us from this, or something we should listen yeah. to, or anything you suggest? Right. So, the, what you're saying is that it seems that some of us have that disease, or it comes to our minds that when we see non-Muslims, we feel like, like does it make sense they're going to go to hellfire? Like, they're going to go to hell, we're not. Um, you know, so what is it that we can do to, to change that situation or to change those feelings, the, 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 those emotions that we may have? You know, it is true. And I'll, I'll be very frank with you. There are days that I'll be driving and I just look around me. I honestly do. I mean, I look around me and, and I see people and they're going about their business and they're doing their own thing and, you know, they're walking with their kids or, ya yeah, subhanallah. And then I think, but they're kuffar. They are non-Muslim. That means ultimately they're destined to the hellfire. Now, of course, we don't point at individuals and say this person is going to go to hell, for example, because number one, they haven't died yet, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Okay. Number two, number two. I mean, we're talking about random people that we don't know. All right. I'm not going to say. I mean, I, I can say with every confidence in the world, with with, with every you know uh, uh, ounce of. of uh, of my, of my fiber and my, my being, that non-Muslims will go to hell. I can say that because Allah Jalla told us that. Okay, in general. But individuals, that's not for me to decide, except those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pointed out. Okay, or His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa pointed out that they're going to be definitely in the hellfire. I mean, that random person I see, well, I know that if they die upon kufr, they're going to go to hell. Okay, but again, did that person ever really hear the message of Islam? Okay, those things are not for me to, to say, I don't know, and so I can't say a uh, person so-and-so is necessarily going to go to the hellfire. But coming back to the issue of, uh, but you know, I mean, how come they're going to go to hell and I'm not? How do we get around that? And I think this is what is important. Number one, by us reading the Qur'an. For, for us to read the Qur'an. Because if we read the Qur'an, what does the Qur'an contain? Our aqidah, our belief system, our faith, what, what we're supposed to believe, and what are we going to find in the Qur'an? See, and this is exactly what helps me. When I see that, I say, SubhanAllah, well, a few things come to mind. Number one, we have to make sure that we, we are visible Muslims, right? Meaning that we open up opportunities for people to discuss Islam with us. We claim that we have these friends and so on. Really, they're your friends? How close are you to them? How much good do you want for them that you're shy to talk to them about Islam? This is a big problem. So, number one, it, what, what it should give us is, is that feeling of responsibility. It is my responsibility to do what I can to present Islam to as many people as I can. As I said, re reading the Qur'an, this is the best thing that, that, you, you know, that will help us to get rid of some of those emotions that we have. Why? Because when you read the Qur'an, you will repeatedly see that Allah knows all things. You will repeatedly see that Allah is all wise. You will repeatedly see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is familiar with the most uh, hidden of things. We will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what is in the hearts of people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that if He knew there is good in that heart, then He would guide it. So by reading the Qur'an, we don't need to listen to anything except Qur'an. Listen and ponder. Quran. So the Qur'an is meant for us to ponder. So we read the Qur'an, we try to understand His meanings, and then all of these you know, thoughts that come to us, and many of them from the shaitan as well. Oh, what makes you better than that person? Look, they're doing so much good, and you know, what have you done in your life? Just because you say, La ilaha illallah, you're going to go to heaven, and that person, you know, just because they didn't say, La ilaha illallah, but look at all the good they're doing, they're, not, they're going to go to hell? Well, if that's how Allah Jalla wa ala wills, then that's what's going to happen. Why should I feel badly about it? I mean, if there was good in them, Allah would have guided them. So ultimately, we must understand Allah knows best. We do not know. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum wa antum la ta'lamun.
I think that's the best that we can say about this, okay? But the other important thing is, it puts that added responsibility on our shoulders. Okay, you can't change people's hearts, but can you not present the truth to them? This we can do. One more. I have... Um... Give us, give us a chance to ask and then you can ask your question. There is some people who explain that they say that it's not so that the complete will be um, whoever is trying to look for guidance, Allah will guide him. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, meaning that, so, so, so is that if is Allah that, subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that that person has goodness in their heart and they are truly seeking hidayah, they want guidance, yeah. he will guide them. So that's a correct opinion. Yes, yeah. oh, okay. the, 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 the Quran. Yeah, because some like say in, in other locations, uh, yes. they yes. say yes. Man yes. like who wants dalala, Allah will. Yeah. Yeah. So look at Allah created and Allah knows who deserves what. Okay, and who desires what? There are those who choose misguidance over guidance. If they have chosen that for themselves, Allah lets them, yeah. lets them go astray. And there are those who are looking for the truth, they are looking for, for something good. And look, if you, if, if you look, if, let's even look in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, some of the worst enemies of Islam, some who were so, such strong opponents of Islam and Muslims, who killed Muslims, but in their hearts, there was something. Who knew? Allah knew. Allah knew. And He knew that, listen, they're, they're struggling with something. And they deserve to be guided. They want guidance. And so Allah will guide those who want that guidance and who seek that guidance. Sahih <laughs> Two questions, but I'll roll them up into one just because it's related. So, for supporting the non-Muslims or attending the, participating in the vigils that they have or whatever they call them, um, one argument I hear a lot from the Muslims is they say, "Well, they stood by us when when something bad happened to us. They attended our events. They stood outside the masjid. They did all this stuff." So that's the first part of my question. And the other one is the uh, right around this time we're going to get greetings for all kinds of holidays. And so, uh, for some people, just say, oh, thank you. When they tell you Merry Christmas, you tell them thank you. Uh, is there something more constructive or better that we can say if it's something that's in passing? You don't really have a time to sit down and explain to them that I don't practice. Right. So the first issue is an argument that, well, why don't we, uh, why don't we attend you know, their vigils and that they come to us if we have something? Well, first of all, we said it at the beginning, our reactions are measured. And our reactions are based on what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, have legislated for us. So, when somebody dies from among the non-Muslims, for example, or they are uh, unjustly killed, we don't have to go and show happiness for it. I mean, this is a neighbor who, who passed away, for example. We offer condolences, but in our way. Everybody. And everybody knows, different cultures, different uh, faith systems, everybody uh, mourns differently, everybody has different rules, and so on and so forth. If they're, I mean, they're misguided to begin with. I mean, let's, let's, let's be very, very blunt and very frank about things. They, they couldn't care less. I mean, they go into, they, they don't believe in covering up, but if they have to go for political reasons or other reasons, or you know, they'll cover up when they go into a Sikh temple, for example. Right? I mean, because, you know, this is, but they don't believe in it. They've got their own motives. Right? right? But they have different motives for doing it. So we're saying that, listen, that's the way you do things, we do things differently. Why do we have to accept what is imposed on us by others? Can we not think for ourselves? Don't we have our own identity? So this is part of exactly what you mentioned, and that is that lack of understanding of what a, what a true Islamic identity is. You no, know, we have to be proud of who we are, and this is how we don't attend vigils, because this is a pagan practice, because this is not legislated in our religion, okay? 
And we are not to follow blindly what others do. We are allowed to be sad. We say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilihi rajiun. The Prophet ﷺ said it himself. And we only say what is pleasing to Allah. What is allowed, we do. What is not allowed, we don't do. It doesn't matter to us what other people do. They do it based on their understanding and based on their beliefs and whatever. Our understanding and our belief is, no. Number one, please Allah. It doesn't mean you have to go out of your way to make other people feel uncomfortable, but no. I mean, if they feel uncomfortable, well, I feel uncomfortable with things they do. Are they going to change it for me? No. And as for the greetings, we do not greet the non-Muslims on their festivals because that is congratulating them on shirk. So, you know, we, 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 we don't do that. If they happen to greet us, and you know now things are changing, they'll say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, yeah. and, and then they do different things, yeah. whatever. So, you know, if it's somebody that you can have a dialogue with, you can say to them, I appreciate your, you, you know, you're wishing me this, but to be honest with you, I don't celebrate Christmas, and, and it's, it, it, and, and hopefully that will open up a dialogue, and you can actually speak to them very nicely, and say that, you know what, because it revolves around a certain belief. And, and we don't subscribe to that belief. We believe in Jesus and we can talk to them about things of that nature. Okay? Mm -hmm. Other than that, um, you know, it's just in passing. Just say, uh-huh, or thanks, or whatever, and then move on. Okay? But we shouldn't feel obliged. We shouldn't feel obliged to respond. Because that is just not right for us. This is not something which Allah or His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa approved of for us. And those who say, out of politeness, that whole politeness card is overused, okay? Because are you going to be polite to someone at the expense of offending your creator? No. So we have to, again, look at things in perspective, Allah Ta'ala. I think, Sheikh, even I think as Muslims, we take it to the extreme. We think that if we don't answer, or if we see something to the other side, they will, be, they will feel an offended. And you know but what we actually call that? it's the opposite. Do you know what we call that? Yeah. We call that an inferiority complex. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> and even, even your sheikh here, they, they believe that there is a multi-culture. And yes. they understand that it's a multi-culture country. And they respect that. So they respect the fact that somebody has, you know, for example, I mean, if you talk to your, to your boss, for example, you tell him, I'd like to go to Friday prayer. He understands that. and he has, and he appreciate actually the fact that you told him that. But it's actually our, our brothers and We Muslims. don't have pride in our own deen. Exactly. This is the whole thing. And to have pride in your deen does not mean that you have to be offensive towards others. That is, first of all, not right for us to offend others. Right? Like Allah Jalla tells us, you don't curse their, you know, their false gods. And then you will be the reason for them cursing Allah Jalla Okay? But okay. we are a polite people. But politeness doesn't mean that we have to submit to uh, the desires of others. We have to be very uh, nice in explaining to them that, you know, as a Muslim, my faith doesn't permit me to do that. Most of them say, okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> you know, they don't really want to get into it. And many of them say, well, how come? Well, some of them may be stumped. I really don't know, but I know my religion tells me no, but I'll find out for you. And we have to follow through. We have to go back to them and explain to them, right? These are my belief systems. Christmas is based on this. And then they would even realize that according to their own religion, there's no such thing as Christmas. <laughs> that is, I mean, it's a, it's a bid'ah within, within their own faith. So, Allah <laughs> <laughs>